everybody. Merry Christmas. All right, we're still saying that, right? Merry Christmas. One amen and oh my, and somebody cleared their throat over here. I'm not sure, but uh, hopefully it is a Merry Christmas for you, ready or not. Here it is, and, uh, and you and I have the opportunity to know the greatest story ever, ever told. And, uh, and that story happened a long, long time ago, and we believe that really, really happened. And we believe that that is essential in understanding, knowing that story, and embracing that story in order to have real hope in this world. How many of you know real people need real hope? Let me start a little bit. Let me back up a step. How many real people came to church today? Okay, all right. How many know real people need real hope out there? And we, how many of you have found real hope in Jesus Christ? I said, how many of you have found real hope in Jesus Christ? Amen. 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 And so uh, uh, we've got a story to tell. And uh, this is a wonderful time of the year. And uh, I'm all nostalgic like many of you. I love all of the great Christmas shows. We play those to our kids. We enjoy those. Uh, R- Rudolph and, and Frosty and, and, and all of those great epic shows that we remember from a, a long time ago. Peanuts, as, as, as Rick reminded us. But we believe that there is obviously something so much deeper than those stories. And that is that Jesus Christ has come. God put on flesh. And that is a pretty amazing truth. And so uh, we're glad that you're here. This is a wonderful, wonderful time of the year. If you have a copy of Scripture, turn to Luke chapter 2. We're going to read in just a moment all that stuff leading up to what Rick led us in reading uh, just a little while ago. But before we do that, just a couple of things. Luke chapter 2, 1 through 7. And in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Luke goes on to put in brackets to kind of help us that this was the first census that took place while Quirinius was the governor of Syria. Anybody remember Quirinius? A few of you. Anyway, uh, and everyone went to their own hometown to register. And so Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house in the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. How many of you know when it's time for the baby to be born, baby doesn't ask for permission first? Baby doesn't say, is this a a convenient time right now? Uh, When it came for the time for the baby to be born, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in cloths, and she placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Let me ask you a real people question. How is your your gift buying going so far? Oh, wow, a collective moan across uh, across the sanctuary. This morning, how many of you, again, real people, you made the mistake of woohooing when I asked how many real people, how many of you have marked everything off your, your gift buying list already? Wow, good for, good for you, right on. Uh, how many of you would say I'm at least over halfway done? Yes, more of you, right? How many of you would say this, this is the litmus test of realness with real people? How many of you would say I haven't even started yet? Whoa, okay, a few of you. Okay, we're going to pray for you at the end of the service. We, we want you to come forward, take that perp walk, and we're going we're to lay hands on you. But, but we all know the pressure of that, don't we? I love you guys so much. I looked online this week. The seven most popular gifts this Christmas season, according to Google. How I many you know Google just knows everything? Uh, for the techie in your life, how many techies? Come on, you can admit to that. All right, thank you, sister, for being a, uh, admitting you're a techie. Most popular gift, Apple AirPods Max. $479, you can get that at Amazon. For the beauty expert in your life, <laughs> my son Sam... That's going to come back on you. Anyway, (laughs) Sam and Debbie, uh, (laughs) 
the, the Dyson Air Wrap Complete Curling Iron. 549 bucks from Best Buy. Curling irons are like over 500 bucks? This is the, and, and this is the most popular one this Christmas. Hey, for the person who loves smelling good in your life. All right, a few of you, that's good. The Ariana Grande Cloud Perfume. Who doesn't want to smell like Ariana Grande? Can I be honest about that? I think I'm going to get a good reaction on this one. For the person who needs a good cup of coffee in the morning. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, we all need prayer after the service today. The Nespresso Virtuo Plus Coffee and Espresso Maker. 189 bucks over at Target. For the fitness fanatic in your life. Wow, man. Wow. The Peloton stationary exercise bike. Only $1,495. You can only get it through Peloton. Isn't that convenient? For the younger kids in your life, very tired people, just raise their hand. The Barbie Dreamhouse playset, $199 over at Walmart. For the gamers in your life, this is the last category, gamers. Sam, the one who also is a beauty expert. Um, <laughs> Nintendo Switch, $349. You can get that at Best Buy. By the way, none are available right now. So. <laughs> You can put an IOU to that gamer in your life that when they unload it off of the cargo ship in the port of Los Angeles, you can have that probably sometime in the summer. Anyway, gift buying, we all do it, right? And we all want the, the best thing. Don't we kind of measure those variables? We want to measure those things. You know, that person who is so valuable in my life, and yet I have to be realistic about my budget. How many of you need to be realistic about your Budget, right, right? We all understand these things. And I, but I want to get them that thing that they, they, they just, that they really want and that thing that, that will really, really just make such a big impact in their life. We're, we're all in the same boat there. But the problem is that in the hustle and bustle of the season, we all run the risk of what? Overlooking the greatest gift, the gift of all gifts, Jesus. We all run that risk, all of us do. And the, and the simple thing I want each one of us to walk out of this space in a little while, whether you've been a, a follower of Jesus for a long time or perhaps you're new, you're seeking, welcome. If you're online, you're checking us out, is that Jesus is the gift of all gifts. He's the gift of all gifts. And I just want to prove that to you. Why I can say, not in some kind of religious way or some kind of schmaltzy way or or some kind of high-gloss way, but, but to prove to you that, that Jesus is the gift of all gifts. Here's what I know. If you're taking notes today, I hope you are. People who take notes get the best seats in heaven. Again, I can't prove that from Scripture. I just got a feeling about that. But here, here's the first thing. And, and here's the one I really geek out over. I'll, I'll spend the most time on, on, on this one. And, and, and I'm going to share a little bit of math with you. How many of you were good in math? Good in math, good. Uh, Debbie, you're a medical person. I'm so glad you're good in math. That's uh, right. How many of you know that's comforting when the medical people you know are good in math, right? Uh, anyway, thank you for, for admitting that. Whether you're good in math or not, I think this is just so, so cool. First of all, note takers, Jesus is the gift that was promised. He was promised. Now listen to this. I, I, again, I geek out over this. In the Old Testament alone, there are 425 prophecies about the coming Messiah. How many prophecies? You were listening. 425 prophecies about the coming Messiah. French mathematician George Heron calculated that the odds of just one man in history fulfilling 40, 40 of the 425 prophecies are, listen to this, 1 in 10 to the power of 157. Now, some of you who are, are math people said, wow, just now. Because that's one, the number one, followed by 157 zeros. How many of you say that's a big number? That's, that's a really, really big number. 
Several of those Old Testament prophecies, of which there are how many? 425, gold star on the forehead, okay, A on your report card. Several of those Old Testament prophecies foretold shared the specifics of Christ's birth. Let me, let me share just a few of those. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, said he would be born a human male. Isaiah 7, verse 14, said he would be born of a virgin. How many of you know that one alone is a pretty far-reaching one? That, that's a... Isaiah 37, 31. By the way, Isaiah was written 700 years before the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. Isaiah 37, 31 says that he would come from the tribe of Judah. Specifically Judah, the fourth son of Jacob. Isaiah 11 and verse 10 said he would come from the lineage and or root of Jesse. Remember Jesse? Jesse's girl? Remember Jesse's girl? (laughs) Showing how carnal each one of you are right now. Anyway... Isaiah 16 and verse 5 said he would come from the house of David. Okay, these are specific things. Micah 5, 2 said he would be born in Bethlehem. Some of you who are going to Israel with us early next year, when you go to Bethlehem, Bethlehem is this big, bustling city. It wasn't like that 2,000 years ago. It was just this little hamlet. It was a sheep town at best, about five miles southeast of, uh, of Jerusalem. Isaiah 9, 1 through 2 said that his family would be from Nazareth of the region of Galilee. Jeremiah 31 and verse 5 said that his birth would trigger a massacre of male infants. Hosea 11 and verse 1 describes that his his family's flight to Egypt, remember that, to save his life. Murderous King Herod is coming after him. Now, Now, here's where I want you guys to geek out. I just shared with you eight prophecies regarding specifically Christ's advent. Eight of how many? 425 prophecies. Peter Stoner, in his book entitled Science Speaks, writes, we find that the chance that one man might have lived and fulfilled just eight prophecies is one in ten to the 17th power. That's that number you see right now. Eight. Eight prophecies, chance of one in that number Just eight, not 425, not that 40 number that I wooed you with a little while ago. Just eight, those eight that I just shared with you, one in that number, one man in human history who fulfilled all of those. It gets wilder. Stoner goes on to explain, if you take that many silver dollars, how many of you would say, okay, (laughs) that would help with Christmas this year, uh, if you take, listen, I love this stuff. If you, if you take that many silver dollars and you put them, listen, side by side on the, sta- on the face of the state of Texas. Evelyn, you're listening to that. You're a Texas girl. Right? Side to side. That, that number. Side to side. Just on the state of Texas. They would cover the entire state two feet that's, the, that's why I was hoping you would react when I was thinking about all this. But it doesn't stop there, you wowers. Now, here's the deal. Mark just one of those silver dollars, mix it in with the others randomly and thoroughly, and then afterwards blindfold a man and ask him to travel over the entire expanse of Texas and find the one silver dollar you marked. That, that is an illustration of the astronomical odds that Jesus Christ could meet just eight of 425 prophecies that he alone fulfilled. Amazing. Amazing. He is our gift. He is the gift that was promised. Second of all, he is the gift that is personal. Don't you want the gift that you buy for that special someone to be personal? Yeah, you know, I know the, you know, the curling iron is really, really, you know, popular. But it might not be that personal. It it might show that I I have enough money or that I care enough to spend that much money, but but I want something that's really going to resonate with that person. See, I'm already envisioning that person's face when they unwrap that uh, at Christmas time. Friends, he is the gift that is personal. 
Yes, he came to the earth. Yes, he came for the world. John 3, 16, right? Most, most quoted verse in the Bible, other than John eleven thirty five, 35, Jesus wept. If that's your favorite one, you need to walk forward at the, uh, at the end. But we know that, that God so loved the world that he gave his what? Only begotten son. He loves the world. But guess what? He loves you personally. He loves you personally. In other words, when he sent Jesus, he knew you were coming down the, down the pike. I remember when that hit me years ago. I think I was in Bible college at the time, and it, and it hit me that, Steve, you have always existed in the mind of God. Think about that. In, insert your name. You've always existed in the mind of God. Ooh, think about that. If you have not, that meant that there are things that God had to learn. That meant that there are things that God does not know, thus eliminating him as God. He always knew you. He always knew when you would come. He always knew who your parents would be. He always knew the circumstances by which you would be here. And when he sends Jesus, he knows... By his sovereignty and by his providence, you're going to come along someday. And he already knew your greatest need. And your greatest need was forgiveness. Your greatest need was salvation. Your greatest need was redemption. Your greatest need was justification. And all the other vacations that we read about in systematic theology. He knew that you needed that and I needed that. Most of all. And he sends his son... Personally, personally, he doesn't send a prophet, he doesn't send an angel, he doesn't send somebody who has some kind of mystical woo-woo kind of powers, he comes personally so that you can know him personally. He is a personal gift, not some generic gift, one size fits all, but he knew specifically to your context, to your life, to your weaknesses, to my weaknesses, he knew exactly what I needed and still need each and every day. See, he's the perfect gift that not only was promised, he's the gift that's personal. He's the gift that's perfect. He's the gift that is perfect. I, I love this. Some years ago, a, a group of Christians were on tour. They were touring the citadel of Saladin in Egypt. A young Muslim tour guide was pointing out the mosques where the supplicants were coming out to pray to Allah and to honor Islam's premier prophet, Muhammad. As he is explaining to this group of, of American tourists, this Islamic worshiper was, was ex explaining things to them. He says, you know what? We, we all seek the same God. You Christians call him God. We Muslims call him Allah. You follow his prophet, Jesus. We follow his prophet, Muhammad. Doesn't it all just kind of come to the same end? One Christian who was on the tour had about everything he could stomach. And he said, sir, you've misunderstood us as Christians. We believe that God himself came down. We believe that God came to this earth as a man, a man among men. That he lived, that he died, that he rose again. And Jesus of Nazareth is his name. Wow. Did he hit a home run. I don't know the reaction of the tour guide, but Jesus himself came. He did not send a, a prophet. He himself came down. And as deity, God in flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, that he was perfect, and that he is perfect, that he is the perfect gift. And we needed his perfection. We needed his presentation. We needed his personification. He came as fully man, which we are as humans, but we know that he came as deity, and in his deity we find perfection, and in his deity we find the remedy for the casting away of sins. Jesus was promised. Jesus is the perfect gift because he's personal. Jesus is the perfect gift because he's perfect. A few more. Jesus is the gift that everyone needs. You've never walked down the sidewalk. You've never passed anybody on Manhattan Avenue that does not need Jesus. And yet so often we say, you know what? Yes, I, 
I have access to people who don't know him every single day, or we have family gatherings, but you know what? Two things I never talk about. Religion and what? <laughs> right? And yet, how many of you would say today, as, as yes, as volatile as those subjects can be, and occasionally are, is that everybody at those tables and in those contexts and in those locations needs Jesus. They need him. And so why don't we talk about those things? Well, I just don't want to mess up the atmosphere. You know, we had a, lot of, a lot of time and effort and resources went into the cooking or, or all of these things. Or I just want to kind of get along with everybody. And I want to be liked here. And I want to be that person that when people gather around at the smoke break, around the water cooler, I just want to kind of fit in with everybody. And yet we all agreed. Everybody needs him. And so why don't we, why don't we talk about him? Romans 3.23 proves it. All have sinned. See, Jesus came to die. I love it where Rick just said that. And that's, that's the meat of the whole thing. Is ultimately he came to die. Not just to be the centerpiece of our nativity scenes. Or not to just give us Holy Ghost goosebumps on the, on the cover of Hallmark cards. But ultimately this baby came so that ultimately he would die. That he would come and that he would lay down his life. He would pay the price that none of us could, could pay. And he came and he is the, the one who comes and that all of us need. All of us need. Lastly, Jesus is the gift that anyone can freely receive. That's great news. Anybody. Some of us would say today, man, Steve, if I had about three hours and felt so inclined and we could just kind of sit down and I could just rewind and I could share my story with you. And knowing that, you know what, you're going to be totally confidential and, uh, and I could just share with you the stuff that's happened to me in my life. And, 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 and Steve, I mean, all the stuff that I've done to other people or still do to other people. Steve, if you could, if you could sit here and... and and I could just share with you some of the stuff I think about. Some of the stuff that I chase after when I feel powerless. Stuff that I keep going back to that I know never fulfills, but I keep going back to it. Steve, if you could hear all of that stuff about me, I'm not so sure you would want me in the directory of New Beginnings Christian Church, South Tampa. Guys, there's somebody who knows you perfectly. I mean perfectly. Nothing hidden. Nothing we've shoved in that closet that, that he's not fully aware of. And he knows us so perfectly, and he still offers himself so beautifully and freely. Isn't that the beauty of the gifts? See, gifts are free, aren't they? How many of you would be offended if you, you picked out this gift, the Ariana Grande perfume? <laughs> and I give it to one of you. My wife might have a problem with that, but I give it to one of you. And you say, Steve, how much do I owe you for that? A little bit light right now. It's Christmas time. Oh, it's, it's, it's a gift from me to you. My heart to you. No, no, I, I, I think I saw online that's 65 bucks at Target. I can't pay it all right now. Maybe I could pay you half right now. How many of you would be offended by that? Real people, you still with me? How many of you would be offended by that? No, no, see, I love you, I care about you. I, I knew what would really get you excited and, and, and would show and, and represent my love for you, and you want to pay for it. And when you pay for it, you, it, 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 it eliminates the whole gift thing. Jesus is the gift that anyone can freely receive. Paul says, man, salvation, salvation only comes 
by grace through faith and not by works, lest anyone should boast. Sad thing is that so many people are hoping, man, I hope all those good things I do, I hope at the end of my life, I know that I'm going to die. Statistics prove that someday I'm, I'm going to die. I hope at the end, I'm crossing my fingers, I'm hoping that there'll be enough good things that I did. That God will look at that ledger and say, oh yeah, you deserve to come in here with me. So many people are rolling the dice with their eternity based on works and goodness. You know, some religions, even here on Manhattan Avenue, it's yes, Jesus saves, but you got to do these things too. It's deceptive. It's not the gospel. The gospel is grace through faith. So, Jesus is the gift that anyone can freely receive, no matter who you are. You know, when we look at the narratives of Luke and Matthew, they still accurately depict what what happened 2,000 years ago. Today, people are the same. When it comes to the advent of Jesus or the person of Jesus, you get the same demographics there. You get the, the indifferent group. These people who were the, of the lineage of David, boy, there were a lot of them spread out all throughout Israel and throughout the Roman world. They, they came to this little place, Bethlehem, to register. Why? Because the sitting Caesar said, you better. And so they're coming from great distances. Mary and Joseph are coming some 80 miles at the absolute worst time in her pregnancy to do that. And they're coming here, and you can only imagine in this little town back then, all of these people in there trying to find a hotel at the last moment. How many of you have ever traveled trying to find a campground or a hotel at the last minute, and you can't find any of these places? And you get there, and, and, and the, all the people, and there's the hustling and the bustling, and, and they're totally blinded. They're indifferent that God is visiting them. And so many people, even this Christmas time, really don't care. Why? Because they don't understand the reason for the season. How about hostility? King Herod embodies that, doesn't he? He, we find, especially when you go to Israel and you take the tours, he was a master builder. Many of the things that he built, those amazing projects, they are still there and functioning. Amazing, but he was a nut job. He was jealous of any contenders for his throne. And here he finds that the king of the Jews has shown up in his little region of the world. And he meets him, not with indifference, but with hostility. And there's still many today, at the mention of Jesus, will still get hostile. They'll talk about anything else, won't they? They'll talk about New Age concepts. They'll talk about all kinds of woo-hoo, supernatural. They'll talk about spirituality in its many, many different forms. But man, you mention the name of Jesus, an instant volatility and hostility. King Herod. But there were some others who worshipped him, the Magi. They worshipped. They came from a long, long distance, great expense, offered the very, very best that they had to this little child, probably about two years old when they show up, and they worship him. Somehow I sense that that's probably the reaction here today, but which best describes you this Christmas time? Is it just another Christmas time? Boy, they're coming around really quickly at this point. Are you kind of indifferent to the whole thing? Would you be honest about that? Do you know anybody right now where they're meeting all of this with great hostility? Are you worshiping? Are you using this as a beautiful open door to worship him? To challenge yourself not to see it through these old dusty lenses, but to, but to experience his advent all new and, and brand new again? Are you seizing this opportunity to build bridges with people? You know, he's the biggest scoundrel on the block, my neighbor. But every year he puts that nativity scene out. <laughs> Are we using this as a bridge to connect with other people? Guys, every Christmas season comes with a a list of all the newest gadgets and toys. Why? Because, right, times change and technology changes and styles change, attitudes and tastes, they all change. But Jesus, he never changes. Never, ever, ever. He alone is the gift of all 
gifts, and he is perfect in every single way. He's always just the right fit in any situation or, or season. He never can be improved upon. There's not a new edition of Jesus coming out. He's always relevant. He's always fresh. You'll never catch him absent. You'll never catch him indifferent or unempathetic in his mood. He's still the same Jesus. Scripture said he's still the, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same Jesus today who cherishes his time with the hurting and the disconnected and the disenfranchised, the lonely, the grieving, the marginalized. In other words, Jesus is still a friend of sinners. He's still our healer. The question I have for you today is, are you sharing the gift of all gifts? Are you sharing him? with other people. Some of you would say, well, you know what? I'm still learning the Bible. I feel like I need to learn more Bible. You know what? I'm still learning more Bible. Here's what I know about you already, whether you have been a follower of Jesus for a long time or, or you're brand new to the faith. Here's what I know about you. You've got a story. You've got a testimony. And there's three parts to your testimony. Again, if you've been a follower for a long time or a new person, your life before Jesus how you met Jesus, and how your life is different now after you've met him. Everybody has a story. Well, you know what? Mine's not very exciting. Never spent a night behind bars. <laughs> Never was strung out with drugs. Don't have any tats. <laughs> you know, only those people. Those are the people. No, you, you know what? If you grew up in the church and you never sowed your wild oats, you were the good church kid. Perfect Sunday school attendance. Here's what I know about you. You were still a dirty, rotten, sinful, hell-bound sinner who needed his grace. You have a story. Are you sharing it? Are you sharing your story about this greatest gift? And you know, lastly, it's, it's dangerous to assume it's dangerous to assume that just because you showed up at the 1030 service on a Sunday like this that you already have received the greatest gift. And I'm just going to ask you flat out, because that's what pastors do, is have you personally received the greatest gift? Have you received him personally? Well, my, my parents did. Have you? Man, my, my dad was an elder in the church. Have you personally received him? Granddaddy was a perfect tither. <laughs> Daddy helped build this church. Have you? See, because when we stand before this holy God, we're going to stand alone before this holy God. And, and the one thing that he's going to want to know is did we have a relationship? Jesus himself said, man, on that day, which will come, many people who put their hopes in all kinds of things, their family and their good works and how much money they gave and, and all these special spiritual gifts, they woo-hooed on the church. And, and man, they're going to go up with great confidence. And Jesus is going to say, depart from me. I don't know you. Do you know him? He is the gift of all gifts. And today you can receive him. That's the best offer I can make. I can't offer you an undercoating on your car. <laughs> I can't offer you some kind of promise that life is going to always go well for you. You're never going to face any challenges. All I can do is to stand up before people that I love and I pray for and just say right now, you, you have the opportunity to receive this gift. If you'll just reach out a hand. You can't buy it. All you can do is receive it. If you had a thousand lifetimes, you could not work for it. And it's the only thing that on that day that will come to all of us will truly make you ready. Receive it. Receive him. 
Most of you said, man, already did that, done that, have that, have a yellowing baptism certificate in a drawer somewhere. Are you telling other people? Are you telling other people? There might be somebody here today, and you're saying, man, I need to receive the gift of Jesus today. Maybe there's somebody here today and say, you know what, at one time I did, but life has gotten in the way, and I have drifted away from Jesus. My physical, anatomical, physiological body is in a pew. But I know that my heart is far from Jesus today. And I'm here to ask you to come home. Come home. Why would you live in the pig pen? Why would you live in a distant land when your heavenly father is saying, I'm looking for you. Where you been? Come home. Come back. Come back to where you belong. If you have a decision to make, would you make it right now?